Hi there, my name is DataBits, and recently I acquired a very interesting piece of vintage home video technology known as EVR, known as the Motorola Teleplayer, which you can see right here behind me. Now this is a piece of equipment that I knew existed, but never thought I'd ever own one of. And through a series of events and some connections on Facebook, I managed to get one of these players. Now, one of the interesting things that I found when I was trying to research this technology was an article that was written in 1970. And that article outlined all the different technologies that were coming out at that time period that were hoping to take our homes by storm and give us what we wanted to watch when we wanted to watch it. Now, the interesting thing about this article was it showed several technologies that I didn't even know existed, it even showed the pricing on some of these models when they were introduced. So I'm gonna walk you through those particular formats, what they were materialized upon, whether it was a tape or a disc, etc. We're gonna talk about that. At the end of this video, we're gonna take this thing apart and I'm gonna show you what's inside. It's gonna be really cool. So stay with me, you'll be really excited to learn there are more technologies for you to collect than VHS and Beta. Before VHS, before Beta, before Video 2000, before Laserdisc, CED, VHD, VCord, VX, and VCR formats, there was another format war. The format war that I'm talking about happened in the year 1970, where the contenders in the race for cassette TV were heading into the ring. The competitors were Radio Corporation of America, Avco, Sony, Zenith, Teldec, Philips, and Magnavox. Each company had its own format. Avco Cartravision, CBS EVR, Normande ColorVision, RCA's Selectivision, Sony's VTR, and the Telefunken Teldec TED format. Each one of these formats used one of these methods to store the information. Videotape, movie film, plastic discs, and vinyl tape. Only one of the contenders that you see here would stay in the race and remain in use even today. The first cassette TV system to be exhibited and marketed in the United States was the Columbia Broadcasting Systems Electronic Video Recorder, or EVR. It was developed at CBS Laboratories by Dr. Peter C. Goldmark, the inventor of the 33 and 1 3rd RPM long playing record. EVR was unveiled to the press in New York on December 10, 1968. Deliveries to industrial and institutional buyers at a cost of $795 per playback unit. Avco Cartravision Cartravision was introduced in 1972 by Cartridge Television Incorporated and was one of the first domestic video cassette systems and the first to offer feature films for rental. Cartravision systems were available as television sets with built-in video recorders. A monochrome video camera was also available for home use. The cassette used two reels of half-inch tape, one on top of the other. Great Richard, that you can play pre-recorded program tapes of feature movies, television programs. On the blank tape, you can uh, use your own little handy-dandy camera, which we have here, and I could put you on television. Yeah. Uh, also, one of the great things with the blank tape, is there is a timer right here, and you can uh, arrange to have a program recorded when you're not there, if you are out for the evening and don't want to miss something. Oh, it would just go on by just itself? Just go on, yeah. right? On the button. That's terrific. Now, what does it sell for, this machine? Uh, this one sells for eighteen ninety-five. Eighteen ninety-five. And uh, this week only. And how about the camera? How much? Camera is two fifty. So all together, it's about twenty-one hundred dollars as of now. Yes, but now, ultimately they will uh, come. Is this down. going to be the sort of thing that eventually everybody can have? Uh, you think? No home will be complete without one. Normandy Color Vision. Normandy or Normande manufactured this machine during the nineteen seventies. It is a fully functional flying spot telecine device that takes special cartridges filled with Super 8 or Single 8 film and provides VHF or UHF output to a television. The machine could handle both silent and sound Super 8 film and featured basic color adjustment controls. 
the device generates a CRT raster on a phosphorescent screen that is refocused via a lens through the constantly moving film. Synchronization is maintained through a photocell that detects the film perforations. RCA Selective Vision RCA's competitive system to CBS's EVR was initially called Holotape and was later renamed Selectivision or SV. This represents the first use of the word Selectivision, which RCA later applied to their aborted MagTape system and, of course, to the CED system. Like EVR, Holotape was a playback only format using what was believed would be an inexpensive manufacturing process. RCA gave a color holotape demonstration on September 30th, 1969. Holotape used electron beam recording to make a color encoded master of high resolution. Sometimes there's nothing good for them on television. <laughs> but there's always something good on Selectivision. Mm -hmm. Sony VTR. Sony's Videotape Recorder, or U-Matic, is an analog recording video cassette format first shown by Sony in prototype in October of 1969 and introduced to the market in September of 1971. It was among the first video formats to contain the videotape inside a cassette, as opposed to the various reel-to-reel -reel or open-reel formats of that time. The cost was affordable enough for industrial and institutional customers, where the format was very successful for applications such as business communication and educational television. The 2850 represents probably the most advanced achievement in VTR design to date for the consumer market. This machine, as we've been told by engineers for some time, was beyond anyone's capability of design. The specifications of these machines have not been released, but I can tell you that they are the highest that we've ever achieved on UMATIC in terms of signal to noise ratio and bandwidth and horizontal resolution. And I think that when you see the product that comes out of this machine, that you'll agree with me that this is in fact a phenomenal device and way ahead of its time. Telefunken Teldec TED. Television Electronic Disc is a discontinued video recording format released in 1975 by Telefunken and Teldec. The format used 8-inch, 200mm, flexible foil discs which spun at 1500 RPM on a cushion of air. TED was first announced at a press conference in Berlin on June 24, 1970. It was developed by a team from two German companies, AEG, Telefunken, and Teldec. Program information was stored in the form of ridges in the surface of a thin, flexible foil disc, which was claimed to be sufficiently robust to withstand being played 1,000 times. Prices Here are the competitors in the 1970 video recording market. On the first column, you'll see the manufacturer. Then you'll see the method that they recorded on, when they intended for that product to go on sale, the playback unit's retail price, and the 2018 equivalent price. Look at the price on that Avco Carter Vision, $5,800, all the way down to the Telefunken Deca Teldec system for $200, or by today's money, $1,300, just a little bit more expensive than your best smartphone. But can you imagine spending $5,800 for the next major video game console? And here she is in the Databit Studio, the Motorola Teleplayer, right here in the flesh. This thing is so cool. If you didn't watch the original black and white introduction video I posted, You'll be excited to know that this thing weighs about 55 to 60 pounds. And I rounded it up to 60 in the video, but it's really right around 55 pounds. Can you imagine lugging around a 55 pound player to a friend's house to watch a movie? No, it actually has a handle underneath here to carry it. But trust me, it takes both hands for me. I'm not a weightlifter. It takes both hands for me to carry this around. It's kind of like carrying around an old TV from the 1970s.
Here's your control panel with simple operations. You have a still reset button here. You have a still button here, which is depressed and then depressed again to release. You have a forward button, a play button, stop button, rewind button, and a door button, which is like your eject. This is your power button to turn it on and off. And then here's your selector. And you can select between the two black and white tracks. So there's two independent black and white tracks on the film. If it's a color film, you'll have one black and white track and you'll have a second color information track as well on the film. Your tape cartridge goes in this compartment right here. You access it via the door button, which you press down very firmly with your thumb. Right here on the front of the unit is a jog shuttle control, or at least a frame advance button. You could leave this thing in pause infinitely and it would not harm the film. There's also a tape counter on the front and this allows you to index certain portions of the films that you watch. On the back of the unit, we have two quarter inch jacks, both for audio in and audio out. Now this machine does not record, so I imagine that is just a pass through. And then we have video out and video in via BNC, as well as a BNC for the RF connector, radio frequency output. So the idea was to connect this to a television tuned to channel three or channel four, and uh, you connect a wire there and then run that wire to the back of your television set. All of which is explained over here on this sticker telling you how to connect to the unit. It actually says right here, channel three and turn it on. So if you've ever hooked up an Atari to an old TV, same theory, wire runs out of the machine up here to an RF converter, which is split. And then it goes into the VHF connector on the back of the television set. Now, because this machine uses film and not videotape, you needed to be able to get inside the machine and clean it, or perhaps break up a jam if the film got jammed inside. So this panel on the back just simply lifts off. You just grab the back end of it and lift and off it goes. So again, there's some instructions on the bottom side of the lid, actually telling you what to clean and how to clean it. And you know, all of the, uh, the maintenance stuff you needed to know even talks about what kind of fuse you would put in it. But again, lifting off the lid gives you access to the take up reel, which you see right here, gives you access to the pinch roller and the capstan, just like a, a regular tape recorder would. And uh, right here is the scanning piece of it. This is like a little tunnel type thing that uh, the scanning mechanism actually runs through. And back here is another panel and this is protecting you from dangerous high voltage, which there are uh, warnings right there on the top of this lid. And then uh, inside is a circuit board that actually got broken as it was on its way to me in shipment. And uh, I'll give you a little uh, shot of that as well. But to do so, we've got to take off these screws. There's one, two, three, four, five, six screws we'll need to remove in order to get access to what's underneath that. Once I've removed my seven screws, I can lift off this panel, revealing all the awesomeness that's underneath. I really like the way this was designed because there are circuit boards in here that are modular. In other words, I can go in and I can remove any one of these circuit boards that happens to go bad and just replace it with another one. Of course, this is now really old technology and the chances of finding one of those boards are pretty slim. So better off to repair them, right? But uh, this was the board that got destroyed on its way to me. And of course it happens to be the flyback board and this has a lot of high voltage going through it. So um, yeah, kind of iffy on that one. Over here is your horizontal H board. Over here is your CRT. This is a CRT scanning system that you have over here. You can see this big magnet and big coil that helps direct the electron beams where they're supposed to go to do their scanning. Very similar to some of today's computers that uh, may have a locking mechanism. To remove a board, you pull these uh, two little lock prongs to the side and then simply lift up the board and the board just pops out. Another thing that's really interesting about this is the smell. This particular machine just has this old vintage smell to it. Just kind of smells like grandma's basement or something. It's really, really interesting. Uh, so here's a close up of one of those boards. You can kind of take a look at what's going on there. Nice big electronics, 
there on that board and uh, probably off the shelf components, very much like the uh, RCA Select Division video disc player, which had a lot of what they called off the shelf components. You could get these at any local electronics store to repair it. That doesn't mean that all of these circuits are off the shelf, but they certainly do look like it. Now, this isn't all of the circuit boards in this machine. There are more circuit boards behind this amazing door number two. So we've got to take that door off and I'll show you even more circuit boards. In order for us to access door number two, we've got to remove the bottom panel. So we're taking a stop there at the bottom panel. I'm going to take that out of the way here so we can now see what's going on underneath this machine. Most of the drive mechanism is over here on this side. We have a gigantic motor that is uh, running everything. You'll see that twirling right there. We have the turntable. It's, it's kind of like a turntable that actually moves the film reel back and forth. And uh, that is handled right here. And we have a bunch of connectors that connect there. We have uh, selector switches going on underneath there. And then these side panels can also be removed as well. So um, you can see some more of the high voltage section right there, more wires connecting everything right there. So uh, take a quick look at this and I'm about to take you to the top panel once more. And as more and more panels are removed from this machine, that amazing scent of vintage comes through. Maybe in the future, some of us tech reviewers can have smell o vision where you can just like, like this attachment will like spray some stuff out on you and you'll be able to smell what we're smelling. So, uh, or just go buy a piece of old tech. So I'm gonna remove this uh, door panel number two and now you see the rest of the guts of this machine. So again, we got a lot more circuit boards. Looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more circuit boards underneath. So just for fun, we'll go ahead and take one of them out so you can take a look at it. So again, we have these two uh, prongs here on the sides that are holding it in place. And there's probably a better way to do this. All the engineers that design this are watching this going, oh my gosh, look at that guy. He's going to destroy it. Okay, uh, so here we go. This says uh, pilot in the middle of it. I'm not exactly sure what pilot means, but uh, there it is. It's pilot. Uh, it also says E1P down there at the bottom. And we'll go ahead and flip it over so you can see the back side as well. And there it is. It is a beautiful piece of art. Imagine this. It's like somebody uh, could create a work of art like this and just like put it in front of a building. You could walk by and trace all the, the circuits on there. Wouldn't that be cool? All right. So what do you think, guys? Let's pull the camera back so you can see the whole guts open at once. And there you are, guys, the entire EVR machine with all of its guts exposed. It's pretty cool, right? So the next thing you say is, well, what about seeing it in operation? We want to see this thing work. Well, guess what? I am right there with you. I want to see it work just as much as the other guy. But I don't have any films for this machine. But I think I've located some and I'm going to uh, work out something to hopefully get some films for this machine so that I can demonstrate its workability. It might need some capacitors replaced. And if that's the case, it would be a better idea not to plug this in. But uh, in any case, this is the EVR teleplayer from Motorola.